Welcome to the David Bordeaux Show, honoring the past, embracing the present, and building the future. Here's your host, author, martial artist, and fitness professional, David Bordeaux. What's up, everyone? David Bordeaux here. And thank you for listening to the David Bordeaux Show, where it's all about discovering the underlying fundamentals of success through the lenses of health, fitness, martial arts, and education so that you could take your life to the next level. In today's episode, I sit down and talk with Restita de Jesus. Restita holds ranks and certifications in karate, eskrima, wushu, tai chi, and other martial arts. She is the host of Dynamic Dojo Talk Radio and the owner and chief instructor of Seattle Wushu Center. Restita has a variety of hobbies that include motorcycle riding, paracord macrame, whip cracking, slingshot shooting, blowgun shooting, knife throwing, and card throwing, to say the least. In this interview, we cover the start of Restita's journey into the martial arts, the introduction and love of projectile weaponry, the use of Tai Chi to help her heal an injury, and the start of Dynamic Dojo Talk Radio Podcast. Before we dive in, today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at davidbordeaux.com forward slash audible. And Bordeaux is spelled B-O-R-D-E-A-U-X. So get on over there and check out over 180,000 titles to choose from that you can listen to on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And now, please enjoy my interview with Restita de Jesus. Restita, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you on. Thanks for having me, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, I have a question, but I'm kind of curious. Is there a meaning behind your name, either Restita or De Jesus? Well, well, we'll start with the last name because that's that's a little more uh, that's a little more obvious. De Jesus means of Jesus mm-hmm. in Spanish. Now, the, there's a funny there's a funny story about the the name Restita because it actually doesn't mean anything. <laughs> what it <laughs> okay. <laughs> What happened was I was born uh, three months premature, and at the time there was there wasn't really as good of uh, preemie care as there is now, right? Mm-hmm. So parents were sort of questioning whether or not I was going to live. I was in a incubator for the first uh, you know few days of my life, and uh, it was in those big incubators where it's kind of like a chicken <laughs> and you're with like several other kids right. and several of the babies in the same incubator passed away oh, and they no. were old by a month or even two months and my parents just gave up hope they kind of went oh my gosh she's gonna pass too she's so small she's so blah 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 but I pulled through and when the doctor was filling out the paperwork for the official birth certificate he asked well, what's her name and they didn't have a name because they thought I was going to pass. So my father suggested that my mother take the uh, couple extra letters out of her name. Her maiden name technically is Restituta. So they took out the extra U and the T and they came up with Restita. And so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, for not having a meaning, there's definitely a, an interesting story behind that. Now, with the name, De Jesus is obviously Spanish, um, and you are Filipino, and I know that there is a heavy Spanish influence um, in the Philippines and that. I do, I am kind of curious. Now, I know that you've been introduced and have taken and have done a lot of different martial arts. Some of the list, some of our listeners may not be aware, but Filipino martial arts was not one of your first styles of martial <laughs> arts. And some kind of stereotypically might assume that it would have been. Um, but I'm kind of curious, could you tell the story of how you came to be involved with martial arts and the first style that you were introduced to? Sure. I was around eight years old, 
and uh, my sister was around six years old. And at that time, my karate instructor at the time, he had gotten a grant to start a karate class at a local community center just a few blocks from my home. And my, my mother found out about it and said, hey, you guys should take karate class. Basically, it was her way of saying, you know, get out of my hair during the summer. <laughs> it, it, all we could do was like sit around and like, you know, be little hellions. So, <laughs> so he enrolled us into these karate classes. And it was a lesser known style called Butokukan Karate. Okay. And uh, people go, what? Butoku what? I'm like, ah, well, I'll explain. <laughs> but um, te- well, technically, I'll back up and explain it. Butokukan Karate is named after the Butokukai Military College um, mm. in Tokyo. Um, so, um, and uh, the the style the style is relatively new. It actually came into the United States from Japan at around 19. 19- between 1962 and 1965. Regarding Butoku Kan Karate, my first day when we started, I fell in love with it. My sister and I just fell in love with it. And uh, it was one of those things where I just became obsessed with uh, anything and everything martial arts. <laughs> uh, I went to every library in Seattle and checked out pretty much every martial art book and was just <laughs> trying to get myself familiar with martial arts um, you know, outside of karate, of course, but with just, you know, the martial disciplines, just because I thought it was just so, so interesting. And um, from there, after I'd gotten my uh, black belt, I, I decided to go uh, to go and pursue other arts. I, I got into Kajukenbo, nice. which was my second art. Um, and I still teach that today. So I got into Kajukenbo. Um, in a method called the Faircloth method of Kajukembo. So it's uh, Professor Terry Faircloth's personal uh, expression right. of um, lineage of Kajukembo. <clears throat> and, uh, and then from there, I was introduced to Sifu Al Dacascos of the One Hopkindo branch of Kajukembo. And I briefly studied under him uh, for, for a bit, for only for about like a year, year or two studied under him and was, and was also promoted under Sifu Altacascos. Uh, but through Sifu Altacascos, I met Grandmaster Kakwe Kenyette of Dose Pares Escrima and, uh, Master Christopher Petrilli, also of Dose oh, wow. Pares Escrima. And, uh, Christopher Petrilli and, uh, Grandmaster Kakwe, um, were both my teachers. It's kind of a, it's kind of a <laughs> interesting language because, because Guru Chris was also a direct student under Grandmaster Kakawe uh-huh. as a, okay. but Chris was my primary teacher because he was more local, and Chris has a diverse background in the Inosanto method of uh, Kali and Eskrima mm-hmm. as well as the as well as Guru Dan's. A blend of Kali and Silat. <laughs> uh, and Chris also studied with the Detour brothers. So, you know, he studied Silat under them as well as Jeet Kune Do. So he's got this diverse background that he blended with the Dose Pares Escrima that, and taught to me and my business partner at the time. Um, and wow. And I thought to myself, now, why didn't I get into the Filipino martial arts earlier? <laughs> what, did think, what did it take like, you know, 15 years for me to figure this out? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and I just haven't looked back since it's, um, you know, anything, anything that I, you know, that I think would benefit, you know, my mind and body. Right. And I, I, I try to get into, I've also done um, Aikido for a little bit. I'm not, certified to teach Aikido. Um, I did Iaido for about 12 years and I still practice it. Um, not certified to teach. Um, Kudo, I've done Japanese archery and I'm certified in that. And, uh, and I just try to practice the best I can and try to incorporate as much as I can into the, into how I teach. Can you tell the stellar, I apologize for interrupting. Can you tell the story about how you got um, interested or how you came to um, learn the archery? Oh, the kudo. Yes. 
I had always been fascinated with projectile weapons when I was a. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I know, it, sounds, it sounds wild, doesn't it? <laughs> um, well, traditional projectiles, I should say. You know, um, that's not to say that I uh, that I that I don't like firearms. I do, but traditional projectiles like sling, slingshot, um, archery. Um, the whole nine yards. I was always interested in that since I was a, a kid in elementary school. I was introduced to archery in a gym class and I thought, wow, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get into this. <laughs> uh, but I never really got into it until I was in my 20s. And even then it was more along the lines of, you know, YMCA type of um, right. dink round. But I saw that there was a class in Kudo. Uh, back in 2005, I believe. Yeah, about 2005. I saw that there was a class in Kudo, and I remember seeing a documentary on the martial arts called Budo mm -hmm. several years before. And uh, and for anyone out there that's never seen that documentary, look it up. Budo. It's it's incredible. <laughs> a little plug for that documentary, but. Um, and I saw and learned a little bit about Kudo through that documentary, and I was enamored by it, by the the ceremonial nature of it and the mind and body connection to the bow as well as the arrow. I was just enamored by it. And when I found that there was a class, a club in Seattle, that and it was a relatively new club, um, my uh, instructor, Yoshi Yamagami, uh, he had come to Seattle uh, to attend the University of Washington, and he was a kudo expert. And uh, he decided to set up a club just so he could keep practicing. So I said, I'm so there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's definitely an opportunity right there. Yeah, I am so there. And uh, he, he, uh, he taught me pretty much everything that I needed to know to, be, uh, to get my shodan ranks. Nice. And now, now that I'm, now that uh, I do have time, it's, well, not that I have time, but now that <laughs> I can shoot, my schedule here at my own studio is crazy, so I really <laughs> can't do anything <laughs> with the Kudo anymore. But I love it. I absolutely love it. It's, uh, for lack of a better term, I call it, you know, shooting zen. You're, okay. you're shooting zen, literally. Right. <laughs> Well, speaking of projectiles, um, you did mention that you have a love for projectiles, traditional. Um, you you also mentioned um, something about slingshot, and uh, I know that you have kind of a, a diverse background, even with what some would consider unique, uh, excuse me, unique weapon styles like knife throwing. Uh, blow darts, slingshots, and and even archery. Now, there's one weapon that you and I both have in common um, besides Eskrima, um, but there's one particular unique weapon that we both use, and that happens to be the whip. I'm kind of curious, could you tell me the story about how you um, became introduced to the whip and what, how you started to use it and even instruct it or, or coach it? Mm -hmm. um, well, when I was studying the Filipino martial arts, um, on studying the Cañete family, um, I found that one of the brothers was really adept at using the whip. And uh, in the Philippines, <clears throat> there are several kinds of whips. You can make a traditional rope whip, which is incredibly heavy, cracks <laughs> really loud, and hurts because it's just made out of rope. It's, there's no leather. It's just rope. Right. Right. <laughs> rope and, and uh, uh, natural fiber crackers. Uh, but then there's also uh, what, we, what we call the calisa whip or calisa latico. And it's basically a horse, horse and buggy whip. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, Kalisa drivers, and there's still a lot of horse and buggy buggies out in the Philippines. Uh, many, if not all, of the horse and buggy drivers would have this whip, which is primarily a thin stick with a lash on the end. Right. And um, so it's 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 about the same 
same length as uh, a general bullwhip. It's just that the handle is thinner and longer. So not only do you have a long stick, you've also got this lash on the end, <laughs> <laughs> which is really cool. It's like a mini lunge whip, right. so to speak. Um, and then there's um, another type of whip that's a little more rare. They call it the buntok pagi, and it's made from ray skin. And it's if you get hit, it's it's um, it's not a flexible whip. It's more like a kind of like a flexible. Um, I don't quite know how to. I can't figure out. It's kind of like a, a shambok. It's okay. flexible, but it's like a stick. Right. Flexible, but it's made out of ray skin, and it's huh. sharp, and it's meant it's meant to cut. Wow! And I thought that was so interesting when I researched these things back in the mid nineties. But in nineteen ninety eight, I was at a uh, wushu competition, and at this um, this festival, so to speak, there were uh, workshops, and I took a workshop in the Shaolin bullwhip. Hmm. Because I wanted to, I wanted to try something different other than the uh, other flexible weapons of wushu like rope dart and chain whip. So I went, oh, I, I want to learn Shaolin bull whip, <laughs> and, and kind of like the kind of like the kudo, I became enamored about the timing aspect of how to use a bull whip. Uh, you couldn't just like you know snap it like a towel. I found that out the hard way. <laughs> oh, really? So what happens when you snap it like a towel? <laughs> Well, when you snap it like a towel, unlike a uh, unlike a towel, which has like more, I guess, mass or whatever, once you snap it and it's shorter, it'll follow where your hand goes. Well, a bullwhip, mm -hmm. on the other hand, the way that it's tapered, if you snap it and bring your hand back, the energy at the end of the uh, of the crack, it's going to keep <laughs> wanting to go. It's going to keep wanting to open. But when you bring your hand back, you are feeding that return energy. And what had happened was that I brought my hand back and the tip caught me right in the side of the face. Pow! Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, uh, I believe in one of the um, Young Indiana Jones movies, I think. Young Indiana Jones. There's a <laughs> the catch does that inside the railroad car. He's like, oh, what's this? It's a whip. And he snaps it and he catches himself like right in the lip. I forget uh, what the scene was, but I think he catches himself in the lip. I, ca I caught myself in the ear... Um when I started to learn whip fighting. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I started learning whip fighting, um, the instructions were, you know, possibly if, if you can wear a, like a cowboy hat that has a ridge, um, or rim, um, wear safety glasses and that, because you're going to hit yourself. You're going to, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to be careful. I've been around whips in the past. I've never really used them, um, extensively or anything, but I, I knew how to crack here and there. But yeah. I did something similar where I had a good crack on the rollout, but then I brought my hand back and all of that energy came <laughs> right back with it. And I, I, I opened up my ear and I was like, wait a minute, I'm wearing this large rim hat. Why? How? Why? It, it, yeah, it definitely it taught some great respect for that weapon. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's uh, when people say, well, I need a hat. Why do I need a hat? <laughs> Believe me, you need a hat. <laughs> right. So, but since then, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, you're fine. Um, so what style of whip do you prefer to use? I, I know that um, you and I had had a very brief um, kind of side conversation a while ago. And then just recently, it was also brought up about the style of whip. Um, while I did learn a small amount of Filipino whip fighting, um, unfortunately, that's really kind of an underdeveloped area that I would like to expand. Um, the style of whip that I personally use are snake whips. And for those who are unfamiliar with snake whips, snake whips, the handle is flexible. It's just like the rest of the body. Sometimes they'll be um, braided or plated a little bit thicker, so there's a little bit more resistance. But essentially, snake whips, you can 
curl up and put into your pocket, depending on on the size and length. Um, I have a custom made four footer and a three footer specifically for weapon use. Um, so I can roll, I can um, coil those up, slip them into the pants pocket of my jeans and go. And that's primarily what I have almost always used. I've only cracked a bull whip. I think, uh, man, I think only like twice in my life. So I know that there's other whip fighters, um, Filipino and otherwise that say, wow, man, you have to have a solid handle whip to really get the feel for it. And I, I, for me, it's practicality why I like to have a snake whip, because if I'm going to use it as a weapon, I should be able to have a weapon on me and be able to pull it out, use it and not have to have a holster or something fancy like that. So with all that said, what, what style of whips, what style of whips do you prefer to use? You know, I actually prefer to use both. It kind of depends on what I'm practicing on any given day. So if I want to practice, like, for example, if I want to play around with latico y daga techniques, so whip and dagger, then I would prefer um, a four foot or four and a half foot bull whip with a 10 to with a 10 inch handle mm-hmm. um, shorter, that kind of thing. Uh, but just like you, when it, in regards to practicality, I keep a snake whip in my car in the little pocket in the door. <laughs> you know, if I'm wearing a coat, a bigger coat, then I can just stick it in my pocket and go. Uh, I prefer to carry that around mm-hmm. person because, you know, it's only three foot. Um, and I, I made it for myself and uh, put extra shot in it just so it's a little bit heavier. Heavier, yep. Yeah, and I like to use it more along the lines of like how we would use a sarong or a garrot. Okay, yeah. You can whip people with it, but yeah, you can yep. bind people with it, choke, uh, you know, hold it in both hands and and use it as a controlling type of a weapon. So, but in terms of what I prefer, like I said, it kind of depends on what I'm working on. Right. I like the feel of a bullwhip. I like the solid feel of a bullwhip, but, you know, if I'm going to be going out on the town, I prefer to have the snake whip in my pocket. Okay. Now, <laughs> you, um, you you did mention using it as like a garrote and controlling aspects, and that's another reason why I, as unique for many people as a whip happens to be as a weapon, one, the one thing that I do like about it, and I appreciate you mentioning about the ability to use it for control, um, for controlling an individual, is that I have a hojo hojo jitsu background, and oh, while that's right, and mm-hmm. while not necessarily tie, you wouldn't be able to use the particular ties that that we do in hojo jitsu with that whip. You still have the ability to control an individual in similar manner, so that you have like that crossover that I really appreciate. And there was going to be something else that I was just going to ask you about, but that just completely (laughs) slipped out of my mind. (laughs) Has something to do with the whip? Um, Well, if it comes back to me, uh, I guess I'll 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 circle back around. Now, I did want to kind of change gears, and you mentioned it um, about us talking about Tai Chi earlier. Now, for those listening, um, Ristita and I. had a little conversation prior to this interview and we were talking about how Tai Chi uh, was a useful um, recovery method for a back injury. And for those listeners who've listened to yeah, episode two, Chris Bennett also used Tai Chi to help overcome an injury that he had. So I'm curious if you could share with uh, the listeners the story of how you utilize Tai Chi to help you recover from your back injury. And if it's okay, like maybe how the back injury happened, but if not, that's fine. Oh, of course. Of course. It's uh, I'd love to tell that story. So that way, um, <laughs> other careful what they do. Well, um, I, I also do Wushu and, uh, in, um, early 2005, I believe, um, uh, early 2005, I was doing a demonstration at um, at a venue that where the stage wasn't as sprung as I thought, right? In fact, I just I didn't even test the floor. Um, I just assumed it was like any other stage. Now the routines that I was slated to do, uh, one of them involved a movement called a a flying whirlwind. So basically, you you jump up in the air, you turn completely upside down and sideways, and then you land on your side for a break fall. 
Um, well, it was a it was a sold out venue and a lot of adrenaline going. So I jump up in the air and I realize, wow, I really jumped up here kind of high. And, and <laughs> I went, well, no matter, that's going to look really cool, right? Well, I landed with a thud on the stage that didn't give it all. Ouch. So I basically fell like seven feet, just dead weight. Oh. Yeah. And I felt it initially on my hip bone. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, that's going to leave a mark, whatever. Show must go on. Let's get up. Um, and I finished that routine. And about five minutes later, I was slated to do another routine with a staff. And by that point in time, I realized, wow, my hands feel kind of doughy. Oh, man. You know, they kind of weird. And my feet felt like, like, the, like they were like really cold and oh, almost wow. numb. You know, that feeling where your feet get cold and they feel kind of numb, that's kind of <laughs> They weren't cold. They just felt the same way right. as if they were cold. And I was like, wow, what's going on? Well, show must go on. And so I finished that routine, didn't drop anything. The next routine was a, um, uh, a southern Chinese broadsword routine. But the whole time, I thought, this feels weird. And I had to end the broadsword, the, the broadsword and the staff form a little bit early because I didn't think I could hold on oh, wow. to the apparatus. So I still didn't think what was go I still didn't know what was going on. So I went backstage and just didn't think about it. And when I got home that night, I was watching TV and I went to go get up out of my recliner and I couldn't feel my feet and I literally fell over. I was and I was like, oh, what wow. happened? So I thought, well, you know, maybe it was that fall sciatica. I know how this feels. And OK, so. I saw a chiropractor, and after about a week of daily treatment, he said, I'm sorry, you're, you know, Rosita, you're really going to have to see a neurologist because I don't know what's going on. You should be getting a little better by now. Wow. So I saw a neurologist, <clears throat> and they did every test possible all the way down to a spinal tap. <laughs> and yeah, they had to check for like, uh, they checked for everything, uh, MS, uh, spine tumors, um, any other anomalies in the spinal fluid, and they couldn't find anything, even in MRIs and CAT scans. However, my neurologist surmised that since a week had already passed, or more, since the initial injury, that if I had indeed injured my spinal cord, that any obvious evidence they can't see at the moment. Because if it had been swelling, the swelling had gone down, mm -hmm. and they they have been able to see where the actual injury happened but she was convinced that I had injured my spinal cord um, to the point where it affected peripheral nerves oh, Wow! explains you know why my scalp was even numb <laughs> 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 so and uh, um, so I said okay well how long is that gonna take and uh, she said I don't know um, it's just a matter of what your what your body can do well, during the recovery phase, um, the numbness turned into pins and needles. Mm -hmm. And it was 24-hour pain, pins and needles throughout my hands and my legs. Um, and uh, I couldn't sit. It would actually hurt. It would feel like the worst sciatica pain ever. It would hurt, so I'd have to stay standing, but I couldn't feel my feet. So I'd sit down, and then there'd be the pain. So no matter what I did... You know, I was, I was, I was at a loss, you wow. know, either I stand, stand up and like not feel my feet and like kind of <laughs> stumble around like when I'm teaching class or I sit down and I'm literally like crying and I didn't like to take pain meds. So I just kind of dealt with it. So the way I taught class for a while literally was to be in a half sitting, half laying position. So I literally brought in a lawn chair <laughs> <laughs> into my studio. And that's wow. how I would teach class. It was the only way to, to still be upright, you know, mm -hmm. and still tell people what to do without crying. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but, um, but I was so, I was so disappointed at that because during the time of my injury, I was training to for a spot on the United States Wushu team for the uh, World Championships, mm -hmm. and um, I injured myself before the team trials, and I I couldn't compete oh, for my man. spot. 
So I was really devastated because that was going to be my last hurrah before I retired from competition. And my Shifu, she knew that. And she said, you know what, Rusty, you know, it's okay. You don't have to do the Wushu anymore. I, I do think you should concentrate on your Tai Chi. And um, so I took her up on it. I, and she was my, uh, my second Tai Chi instructor. But um, the longest one that I studied with, um, and, you know, before that, I, I just didn't take Tai Chi very seriously. It was part of my karate class, so I didn't really take it seriously. And I was a kid. Well, this time, I took her advice. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, being a Chinese national, uh, with her being a Chinese national, I said, okay, you know, she knows what's up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so... I, I delved more into the Tai Chi and she gave me specific parts of the, the Yang uh, 108 form and 85 form to practice and specific movements of uh, the Chen style to practice. And, and, I, and I realized why she did it that way. The Yang style was to get me to move. And to feel my feet and to be aware of where my feet are, even though I couldn't feel them. Right. And to remember a different body reference, even though I couldn't feel my feet. And also to, um, to work on my flow. The Chen style was more for me, I okay. found out later. Was more for me and the the fa jing to be able to, <laughs> you know, to release the energy the way that I know my to the, the way that she knew my heart would. Have <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say she. It sounds like she knows you <laughs> or knew yeah, you. She knows me um, because Chen style was my was my specialty at that time before I injured myself. And she's like, oh, okay, you must do the young style first. And I went, oh, well, <laughs> that's fine because I knew it, and that's and that's fine. And but religiously every day without fail. I would do exactly as she would tell me or she would call me and modify something. And, uh, and I did it. And, and after I started to get feeling back into my arms and my legs, did I realize that all, all she really wanted me to do was be disciplined in moving every day to uh. not sit in that lawn chair and just teach classes because, mm-hmm. you know, in my head at the time, I thought that, okay, yeah, I'm still being active or whatever. Well, active teaching and active doing, <laughs> as you and I both know, are, are completely different. Right. And she, she just made sure that I did it every day without fail, disciplined. That it, Same time, every day. Yeah, that's... that's- <laughs> I really appreciate, especially that last part, um, because in my interview with Chris, um, Chris Bennett, he had a, an established routine where every day he did something a particular way and it was, he, he dedicated himself, himself to it and he always did it and always did it. And over time, of course, he extended periods of time because he only did one particular um, pose. Uh-huh. Or posture. He only did one, but he continued that discipline and, and built it up with time. Whereas with you, you were a bit more dynamic, but it was still the aspect of, of moving and being dedicated to that moving and that, that essential, essentially healing process. Yeah. So that, that's, <laughs> that's take notes, everybody take notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. It's kind of like, you know, that old saying, if you don't use it, you lose, you lose it. it you know? Right. Yeah, uh, you know, she, the the main thing that she wanted me to do again was to move, and to allow my spine to keep flexible during that healing process, as opposed to, you know, like if you have your leg in a cast for what a month or two, and then they take the cast off, and then you're like, oh, you know, I can't work or whatever. It's because it's been immobile. Right. Um. So, but yeah, it was a, it was a. Just a, I, I credit it, the Tai Chi and the, um, the daily moving with my recovery because 2020 hindsight, I know that if I had not followed that kind of practice, I would have been in the lawn chair and taught every day <laughs> and convinced myself that I was being active every day when I had not. Right. You know? So, 
Yeah. Well, going <laughs> going with, uh, and I am going to shift gears here, and I know our time is pretty tight on both of our sides yeah. here. Um, with the idea of moving, um, you have a podcast called Dynamic Dojo Talk Radio. If we have time, could you share the story of how that came into be and and what your focus was? Oh, sure. Um, I initially started off on Blog Talk Radio as a co-host for um, another martial art colleague of mine, and that show was called Moderate Combat Masters. And um, I was pretty much like the support in the background, right? <laughs> Color commentary. Yeah, yeah. And I would add extra commentary, that kind of thing. And um, I was talking to another friend of mine, Robert Deal, and uh, we've got like this um, a wild sense of humor when we're together, yet we can be serious. At the <laughs> time. It's just crazy sense of humor. And he said, hey, you know what would be funny is if we had a, a show together. And I said, well, why don't we? And that night... I put together Dynamic Dojo Talk Radio and made him a co-host. And I called him up and I said, "Okay, dude, we've got a we've got a show." And he's like, <laughs> "What?" And I'm like, "Serious show? Let's do it. Sundays at 6 p.m." And he's like, "Okay." And that was in November 2012. And uh, we've uh, we're still going strong now. And at the time when we put it together, our whole premise was to bring the martial art community back together because at that time there was this point in time where he, both he and I were both personally dealing in um, organizations or or situations where there would just be a lot of politics right. in the martial um, even in the same styles yes <laughs> you've got the Body people going, well, no, my, my school does this better, and da, 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 you know, and arguing over kata or arguing <laughs> over how this one technique is done and friendships are lost and yeah. schools are, are torn asunder because of just politics. And Bob and I realized after we had, uh, we had heard this thing on the radio. Actually, it was me. I heard this thing <laughs> on the radio. I told him about it. I, I, I heard this on a radio, somebody else's radio interview that explained what politics was. The woman had said, politics is when an organization loses sight of the original founder's vision. Ah. Well, and that, yeah. I, <laughs> no, right? That's yeah. when the, the, the arguing happens. And, and we thought, that is so true. Why don't we use the show as a medium for people to meet like on the same level ground, you know, even within the same style or different styles, they're meeting on the same ground, equal ground, and they can discuss this or that or the other thing. And we're in charge of the house. No fighting in my house. You can't be fighting in my house. You're going to play <laughs> nice in my playground. And that was, that was the whole premise to bring people together and, and to, for people to realize really that there isn't, all that much difference between your dojo and that dojo in the same style or right. this style and that style. And so far, knock on wood, it's, <laughs> it's great. And we've added um, several other segments other than just interviews. Uh, we've added uh, news and, um, and forum discussions and, and stuff like that. And it's, it's just been a blast. Wonderful. I, I really appreciate that vision. Um, I know that a lot of people that I've talked to have that same sort of experience where they, they feel the politics, they hear the politics, they see it and it causes issues. And a lot, a lot of, a lot of us are like, you know, we're beyond the, you know, Oh, this particular style, or like you said, this dojo versus that dojo, we're beyond that. We, we are martial artists at heart, regardless if we have one style or many styles. Um, and that's something that I know with this, with um, this show is that I would like to help others come to understand that even if you practice just one particular style or one martial art, it doesn't mean that 
you know, that there isn't a whole wide world of other martial artists that you can learn from, even if it's just to listen to other people's stories. And that's why I like to have people such as yourself come on to share your stories and kind of tell what your path has been like from your side of the mountain, because we're all going up the same the same mountain here. And while we may have different experiences along the way, I, I would like for other people to go, oh, you know what, we're going to the same point we're going to the same summit but our experiences are slightly different so i'm really happy that you know you've been going really strong with your with your podcast uh, dynamic dojo talk radio and i'm really excited for the listeners of this show to check it out and i'm going to have links to that in the show notes of this well Rosita, i really appreciate having you on um there's a lot more that we could talk about so maybe we could schedule a time in the future to keep this going um but th thank you so much for being a guest thank you thank you for having me you're listening to the david bordeaux show before you go i want to say thank you thank you for taking this time to listen to the david bordeaux show I know that there are many things that you can spend your time listening to right now, but you chose to spend it with me and to listen to this show. And for that, I am greatly honored. For the times that you're not listening to The David Bordeaux Show, I want to share an offer that Audible has made to the listeners of The David Bordeaux Show. Audible is offering a free audiobook along with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. The great thing about this offer is that regardless if you continue with the service or not, the audiobook is yours to keep, even if you do decide not to continue. I've used this service for a really long time. I've purchased many books and I've listened to them a lot. I've even had to cancel my service twice. And the great thing is, is that my books were still there, able for me to go and download and re-listen, um, even without the service. I've since restarted my service and I've purchased many more books and I've listened to a lot of them on my commute, turning my, essentially turning my commute into a great learning opportunity. There are two books that I would like for you to check out if you have the opportunity. And you might even get one of these for free if you decide to take Audible up on their offer. The first book is called So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. Cal's audiobook details why the development of skills supersedes passion in the quest for work that you love. Not only does this book support many of the understandings that I already had, it opened my eyes to ways of how to go further and improve my skills to help accelerate my successes. The other book that I would like to recommend for you to check out is How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big by Scott Adams. Yes, the creator of Dilbert. In this book, Scott details many of the failures that he's encountered in his life. He also explains how those failures led him to win big, and most of the time in ways that no one could have predicted. This audiobook is not a roadmap to success. Rather, it illustrates how Scott pursued a conscious strategy of managing his opportunities to make it easier for success to happen. All that you need to do to get one of these audiobooks for free, along with a free 30-day Audible trial, is go to audibletrial.com forward slash Bordeaux. That's B-O-R-D-E-A-U-X. You could choose one of the books that I mentioned or choose one from over 180,000 titles that they offer. That includes newspapers, magazines, and classes. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash Bordeaux. That's B-O-R-D-E-A-U-X and get started today. You've been listening to The David Bordeaux Show. To find the show notes or to comment on today's episode, go to davidbordeaux.com forward slash podcast. To subscribe to the podcast or leave a review, search The David Bordeaux Show on iTunes. Until next time, thank you for listening.